Good morning. Good morning. Wouldn't it be great if God would just physically appear before us and sit and talk with us face to face? Since he doesn't, people have managed to come up with a few different ways to express themselves to God so that they think they are impressing him when all God really wants is for us to be real and honest and still. God? Yeah, I'm right here. Um, it's me, and I know we haven't talked in a really long time, and that is totally my fault. So if you don't mind, I've worked out the verbiage, and I think I've got it down. So I'm going to pray to you right now, and I think you're going to be impressed. So here I go. <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father, beseech me not unto thee. Oh, how now, brown cow, <laughs> mine soul is so dry, and if I could just catch a morsel of who you are so verily, merrily, down the stream, O oh Lord, mine soul is so dry, if I could just catch a morsel of who you are, Lord, thine has heard thou prayer. I'm a poet and did not know it. Uh, you could just talk to me normal. Amen. <laughs> There's so much more I wanted to talk to you about. Hey, God. I'm here. I know we haven't talked in a while. Kind of been busy. There's some things I wanted to talk to you about. Got to pull out a piece of paper from my pocket. I wrote them down on the prayer list, so I'm just going to lift these suckers up to you. <laughs> First of all, there's my mom. I, could, I just want to lift her up to you. She needs your help, Lord. Could you just well, go out? Just get her off my back. <laughs> I'm nearly 18, and well, could you just take your big God remote and push mute on her channel? I'll get to college when and if it is right for me, all right? I need to find myself first. Ugh. Also, there's my car. Just because it is older than, older than me doesn't mean it is cool and retro. It's a Yugo, for your sakes. What were my parents thinking? So if you could just, I don't know, use your God wand thing and turn my car into something nicer, nothing big, but a Lamborghini would be nice. Oh, also, there's this girl, Megan, at school. Created in your image. She is hot. But whenever she looks at me, she looks kind of nauseous. Got anything in your bag of tricks for that? Oh, you know what? I got a lot of stuff on my list here. And I can read them to you, or you can. You're probably a speed reader, right? Amen. There's so much more I wanted to talk to you about. God? Yeah, I'm right here. It's me, and my life is just crazy. No matter what I try to make my life better, it doesn't work. It isn't fair. <sighs> Forget it. I'm just going to be real. My parents have had it with me. They locked me out, and I had to sleep in the car again last night. Fourth night in a row. I know. I know I've made a mess out of my life. I know it. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to fix things, okay? Do you even hear me? Yeah, I'm right here. Because every time I pray to you, I feel like my prayers are bouncing off the walls. When does this get better? What's the use? What's the use? Amen. There's so much more I wanted to tell you. God? I'm here. God, I'm here. God, draw near. Come to me, my Savior, because I love you. You are so grandiose, and I am so tiny most. <laughs> you are the one for all time. You're my master, Savior. I love you. Mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. <laughs> Look at me, world. I'm praying. Yes, but to who? Amen. There's so much more I wanted to say to you.
God? Yeah, I'm right here. Hi, it's me. Um, and I thought I'd come to you before I go to bed tonight. God, I just wanted to say thank you for this amazing playground we call Earth. It's so awesome. I just really want to give you... I just give you... Uh, oh, God, God, um, I just want to be salt and light to the world, you know? I just want to be salt and light. And uh, just a big old bag of salt and light and, you know, lalt inside a pepperoni. An oregano. Um, God, um, you, you, you deserve the very best of me because you made me, and I just want to do that every day, just to give you the best of me. Oh. Men, there's so much more I wanted to tell you. God, I'm here. You're amazing. You're greater than anything this world has to offer. I love you too. I can't wait until you come back to Earth. That's going to be so amazing. But until then, could you help me live my life as if I'm just walking hand in hand with you? I will, but you need to trust me. Not just when chaos happens or calamity happens or when you don't get your way, but in the most ordinary of days. I'm weaving something. Trust me with everything. I want to trust you more. In fact, as I talk about trusting you, there's some things I need. I'm not asking for anything extravagant. Just take care of my daily needs. I know your needs before you know your needs. And that's where this relationship gets a little mixed up sometimes. You go after the things you want and you think you deserve instead of relying on me for your daily bread. Consider the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. I take care of them. Think about how much more I take care of my kids. That's so true. I'm sorry I forget that. In fact, I'm sorry because I've blown it so many times, even just already today. Please forgive me. I've forgiven it. I've forgotten it. You're the only one who keeps bringing it up. You keep bringing up the things of your past and replaying them over and over again. All it does is produce shame and guilt. That's not why I created you. There's a purpose and a reason for you, but I need you to trust me. Quit beating yourself up over the past. Okay, I'm trying. This life, this world, God, it's just filled with spiritual potholes, and when, Shh. just help me to walk Shh. so that I don't fall down, Shh. because I know the truth of it is. Shh. Excuse me? You talk way too much. Most of my children do. I thought that's what we were supposed to. They're always so busy. They never just slow down, be still. So many things distracting them. It's hard for them to connect. Be still and know that I am God, the great I am. That's good. I forget to slow down. Listen, um, if it's OK, could I just worship you? I love that. Thank you. I know they've done that three times. <laughs> I'm really grateful. So here's a confession. I do not consider prayer to be my greatest spiritual gift. Praying with other people, that's a major part of my job. And I take it very seriously. And so if you come and you spend some time with me in my office, and we talk together. If I call you on the phone, if I visit you in the hospital, I will pray with you. You will not leave. I will not leave until we pray together. And it's one of the things that I really value. In fact, it's probably one of the times in my life when I feel closest to God. Because I always feel the presence of God in those moments when I'm praying with somebody else. And I should. 
One of the things that Jesus says is, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. But when it's just me, it's kind of a different story. I struggle with prayer. I'm pretty easily distracted. So I sit down to pray, and I start to think about, well, there's something that I didn't get done. I better write that down. There's an email that I forgot to send. I better pick that up and send that, right? And before long, you're so far away from it that you can't regain your focus. Now, I've learned that there are some things that you can do in order to help you with that. I mean, one of the things that a lot of people find very helpful is to uh, pray while they're exercising. Because when you take your body and you're doing something with your body, you have the ability to focus your mind somewhat better. But part of the problem is then it seems to me that in the midst of all that activity, that it's hard really to be quiet and to really hear what it is that God has to say to me. I've tried different ways of praying. I've tried, you know, lists and journals and different things. But when I do those things, then I find that prayer just feels like kind of like a homework assignment. Really? I have to write this down? All of this? Really? And I don't want prayer to feel like a homework assignment. I want it to feel like a conversation with an old friend. So I'm still wondering, you know, what's the right way for me to pray? And then, too, just like you, I have questions. All of us have questions about how this thing works. I mean, should I really bother God with every little thing that's going on in my life? I mean, doesn't God want for me to take care of some of the things myself? Exactly how much faith do I have to have in order for my prayers to be effective? Because I can find passages in the Bible, I can find where Jesus says, well, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, then you can pray, and it'll be heard, and all kinds of things will happen. Find in James, though, James says, if you doubt even just a little, nothing's going to happen. Don't expect anything from God. So which one of those things is right? Or how about this one, which I find probably the most difficult of all. When I'm praying for someone to get well, and they're not getting well, how do I know when it's time to stop praying for them to get well and start praying for them to peacefully pass from this life? How do I know? Most books about prayer are not really helpful with these questions because most books about prayer are prayer books. Pick them up, here's a prayer, and here's a prayer, and here's a prayer. They don't wrestle with these questions. But I have found one book that I want to recommend to you that you might enjoy, and that I'm enjoying. It's by Philip Yancey, who's one of my favorite uh, Christian writers. And he writes very frequently about kind of the difficulty of faith, struggles of faith. And he wrote a book in 2006. It's called Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? And if you're looking for something to help you kind of explore some of these questions that we're going to be talking about over the next six weeks as this series unfolds, that might be the book for you. Again, it's by Philip Yancey. It's called Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? And uh, if you go onto Amazon and you just look up Prayer Yancey, it should be one of the first things that comes up. So I highly recommend it. Let's get started here with the sermon proper. I know, that was just the extended introduction to the sermon. Uh, but let's start with prayer. God, we give you thanks for everything that you've done. And we give you thanks for the way that your work in our lives and for this day. We know that we have questions about prayer. We know that we struggle with prayer. We pray that we might hear a word from you today about how to pray about how you're at work. Lord, we pray that we might have the courage to be able to ask the questions that we have on our hearts and in our minds. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All of us have our doubts about prayer. When Stephanie and I lived in North Carolina, we lived in Raleigh. And uh, during basketball season, it was not uncommon for somebody to lift up their hand and say, I pray that Duke wallops UNC today. 
And then somebody else who would be a Chapel Hill alum would say, yeah, I'd like to pray exactly the opposite of what he said, right? Somebody uh, put it to me recently this way. So what happens when you go to a football game and it's Boston College versus Notre Dame? Both of them are Catholic schools. Both of them presumably have people praying that their team will win. How does God decide who's going to go home with the trophy? Now, that sounds like a silly thing to think about, but it actually points to a pretty significant issue. And it's one that Abraham Lincoln raised in his second inaugural during the Civil War in a much more serious context. You've probably heard these words before. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. And now looking back, we have the sense that justice did prevail in the war between the states, or depending on where you are in the country, the war of northern aggression, right? We have the sense that justice did prevail. But we think about the tremendous cost loss of life, hundreds of thousands of people. Philip Yancey in his book, uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, he sums up the difficulty of believing in a God who gets involved in human affairs with this quote. It's a quote that he lifted from a professor of philosophy, which I think sums up the issue pretty well. If God can influence the course of events then a God who's willing to cure colds and provide parking spaces, but is not willing to prevent Auschwitz or Hiroshima, is morally repugnant. Now, those are pretty strong words, but I think they accurately get to the real conundrum that we have around prayer. I find that most every objection to faith stems from one root cause. And most often, it is the problem of evil in the world. Faith would be a whole lot easier if this world were easier to live in. It's not. And yet, remarkably, we continue to pray. So the Pew Research Center did a study back in 2008. It was a huge study. 35,000 people were interviewed for this study. And one of the questions they asked, it was all about religion, and one of the questions they asked was, do you pray? And if so, how often? 60% of Americans say that they pray every day. 75% of Americans say that they have prayed once in the last week. And now, in that same study, though, only 31% of people believed that they had had an answer to prayer within the past month. So there's a disconnect. 60% of people say they pray daily. 75% say they pray at least once a week. But only 30% say that they have had an answer to prayer in the past month. So we're praying, but we're not finding anything particularly satisfying about it. We're praying, but we are wondering if it really changes anything. And so as I thought about how to start this series, I wondered, honestly, if there was any sort of softball that we could throw to God. I mean, any prayer that we know God will answer so that we could establish just on some level a degree of trust that God is listening, some degree of confidence that God is hearing us. And as I considered it, I hit upon one. One that I thought we'd be in good company if we decided to pray together. Because it's one that the 12 disciples prayed. I don't even know if it really constitutes a prayer as much as just kind of a general exclamation of where they were at. It's from Luke chapter 17. The disciples say, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. Now, you could pray it in a fancier way, of course. You might pray it in the way that Paul lays it out in Ephesians. 
I pray that the Lord of our, uh, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know Him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power for us who believe, according to the working of His great power? Now, that's a great prayer. That's great. I wish I had written that myself. It's asking more or less for the same thing. Lord, increase our faith. We want wisdom and revelation. We want to have the eyes of our hearts open. We want to know the hope of Jesus Christ. We want to know the power of God at work in us. This passage is so beautiful to us because it just sounds like something that we ought to say in church, right? These are the words that we are expected to say in church. But just like we heard in that first little vignette, you know, that when, we, when the youth came up and did their skit, right? It was just like that. It doesn't sound anything like anything any of us would say at all. It doesn't. So I think for today, for our purposes, simpler is better. Lord, increase our faith. It's honest. It's an expression of the fact that we are not where we want to be. We're not where we want to be with our lives. We're not where we want to be in our faith. And it speaks to this desire that I assume that every person who comes in our doors has. Every single person. Otherwise, why would we be here at all? Lord, increase our faith. It speaks to why we come here every Sunday morning. Now, you may feel like your faith is starting from zero. You may feel like you wonder whether God even exists, whether God is listening, and even if God is listening, whether God cares enough to respond to us when we pray. Well, today, I want you to embrace this prayer, these four words, Lord, increase our faith, as a starting point for trying to figure that out. You can think of it as an experiment if you want. Lord, increase our faith. Think of it as a way of inviting God into your life. Think of it as inviting Christ into your heart. Lord, increase our faith. Faith is not something that we can will into existence. It is something that is a gift from God. It's a gift. Now, that doesn't mean that we are not required to take some action in order to make it real. This is a really simple illustration I was reading um, on someone's webpage, and it's the idea that, you know, maybe there's a chair in your house somewhere, kind of a rickety chair, and you put it in one of the upstairs bedrooms because you know it's a rickety chair and it's not good for at the dining room table anymore. But you know what happens? When a light bulb goes out in that room, you go looking around for a chair, and that's the one that's in that room, and you are too lazy to go get a lap. So what do you do? You look at the chair, you say, I don't know if I trust it, but you know what? I gotta change this light bulb. So you step up on it and you change the light bulb. Now, in that moment, you had your doubts, but you also had enough faith to stand on that chair. Now, faith is the same way when it comes to prayer. The act of praying is an act of faith even if you don't know for sure whether anybody is listening or whether God will respond, it's the same thing. It's just like getting up on that chair. It's taking action, which constitutes the human part of faith. It's said that Venkaya, who was one of the first outcast converts to Christianity in India back in the 1800s, said that Venkaya prayed, prayed a single prayer every morning. His prayer went like this. Oh, great God, who are you? Where are you? Show yourself to me. He prayed this prayer for three years before he became a Christian. And after he became a Christian, he pursued people 
with the same kind of desire and the same kind of tenacity that he pursued God. He became one of the greatest missionaries to his caste, the people called the untouchables, the Dalit caste in India. I believe that the prayer for faith is a prayer that God will always answer. I know it seems presumptuous for me to say that, to speak on God's behalf and say, well, this is the prayer that God will always answer. But I believe that it is the prayer that God will always answer, that God must always answer. If God seeks people to follow, then God is on the hook for this one. Lord, increase our faith. And I don't feel bad putting God on the hook for that today. I don't fear that I'm going to be struck down here. That's God's job. Now, I hope that your journey to faith doesn't take three years. I hope that it doesn't. How about if we make the agreement that for six weeks, for the duration of this series, that we pray this prayer. Lord, increase our faith. Can we make that agreement? That we pray this prayer. That we pray it for ourselves. That we pray it for our families. That we pray it for our church. That we pray it for our nation. That we pray it for the world. Lord, increase our faith. At the end of the six weeks, I want to hear how that turned out. I really do. Amen?